Well, one of the most polarizing, stressful Cowboys seasons in recent memory has finally come to an end. Now, the Dallas Cowboys do lay on a hearty, I think, 47-16 to beatdown of the Washington Redskins in the regular season finale in Dallas. However, it doesn't translate to a playoff win here. Last week's loss to Philadelphia obviously took your destiny out of your own hands, and you needed the Giants at MetLife to beat the visiting Eagles to make sure Dallas got in. If Dallas won and the Giants won, Dallas would get the spot for the NFC East. It did not happen. And before we get into all of that, let's just focus on this game. The Cowboys playing in what will probably be Jason Garrett's final game as the head coach of the Dallas Cowboys came out, shocker, pretty slow offensively. Like Dallas was gifted two turnovers by the Redskins in Redskins territory to give it great field position. It went out three and out for the offense on its first drive. The defense then got a turnover with Jalen Smith's first career interception that set Dallas up in Redskins territory, just inside midfield, about the Redskins 36, I want to say, so a little bit further than that. And Dallas walks away with three points. All right, bummer. You like the free points, but you really would have liked a chance to capitalize on that with a touchdown. Well, then the next drive, Dallas forces a fumble as Adrian Peterson gets stripped. Dallas recovers again. This time they set up even deeper in Redskins territory, about the 39 or about the 30 yard line, 29, something like that. And again, three points, two takeaways deep in Redskins territory, six points to show for it. The Dallas offense started out the game pretty, pretty poorly, like they faced on consecutive possessions, third and 18. Third and 18, twice in the first three possessions. Like, that is, that's inexcusable. There's no excuse for that happening. And even then, that second field goal, Dallas caught a break. Because in that, you have Ezekiel Elliott with a critical fumble. Like, the play is blown dead. The referee says forward momentum has stopped. And as a result of that, he blows the play dead. But Zeke is clearly stripped by the Redskins. They pick up the ball, and they're off to the races. It should have been 7-3 Washington at that point. But the play was blown dead. Callahan, former Cowboys offensive line coach and coordinator, uh, Bill Callahan, tried to challenge it, but you can't challenge when the referee came in and blew the play dead. Therefore, it was upheld. Dallas still gets that field goal at 6 nothing, And... You know, the defense continued to hold. The Redskins then had a a fairly lengthy drive, got deep into Dallas territory, but had to go for it on fourth down, and the Dallas defense held them again. So it was a very slow, meandering start for the Cowboys in this game. I mean, even at half, it was, what, 17-7? to Like, it was not a game that Dallas, and that's an approximation, but it was not a game Dallas was grabbing firm control of. Now, they did in the second half. In the second half, Dallas started laying it on thick. The first touchdown, first of all, in this game, you could tell it was another week with Dak not throwing the ball at all. He finally alluded to, yeah, something's not right. Like, I don't, my arm doesn't feel right. I don't feel comfortable throwing the ball right now. And there was some concern over his ability to throw a deep ball. And you saw that. Dallas looked like it could not stretch the field in the first half. And maybe as Dak got just more warmed up and loosened up a little bit in the flow of the game, that came to him a little bit. But... As a result, it required uh, required some careful maneuvering by Dallas. Now, you still get that touchdown reception to Zeke in the corner of the end zone in the first half. That gives you that. And then Michael Gallup pretty much does the rest. Michael Gallup, phenomenal in this game. Now, he did have two drops. Again, still leads the team in drops. He's going to have to work on that because in the first two years of his career, although he went well over 1,000 yards this year, and you know had himself a very fine sophomore season he he looks like a top tier wide receiver number two he's not a wide receiver number one could he become one potentially but he's got to cut out those drops and he's got to start winning uh in double team matchups and right now he's not doing that he's not doing that enough mostly because he's not being asked to do it a whole lot amari cooper is drawing that attention and cooper had a 90 yard day as well after a semi-slow start he gets a 45 yard reception does cooper Uh, that finally got the Dallas offense going and set up that Zeke reception touchdown in the end zone. But Michael Gallup takes several plays. He he makes a dazzling play on one 
on uh, one such reception. Dak hits him, and it looks like Dak is leading him into just a freaking level of a tackle coming. And in the old days of the NFL, he would have been. Uh, Gallup would have been nearly decapitated in that play because he's running a straight line towards the defensive back. The defensive back knows the ball's coming to Gallup. And in a previous era, he hits him. He blows up Gallup. It's a defenseless receiver situation, though. So with the new rules, he knows I can't go high and I can't hit him while he's not looking. I can't blindside him. So he tries to go low. And what results is Gallup getting turned out, which if you saw the thumbnail for this video, it is the still frame of Gallup basically helicoptering a little bit in the air, keeps his feet, and then a basically 28-yard Gallup, pun intended, down the sideline for pay dirt. And he just continued to win, man. He continued to make big plays. Five catches, 98 yards, and a career-high three touchdowns. Dallas in the second half, yeah, they they pulled away and they blew it out. Again, 47 to 16. That's great. That's all well and good. Dak ends up 23 of 33 for 303 yards and four touchdowns, no picks. Had he had his shoulder not been a problem and he wasn't throwing behind some of these receivers and not had a couple more dropped by Gallup and and uh, a couple other guys, I think that this is an even bigger day for Dak. But it doesn't matter is what it boils down to. Dallas wins comfortably. All that mattered is what was happening at the same time, all actually a little bit ahead because the game ahead of Dallas uh, went, ran a little long. But what was happening at MetLife was what mattered here because Dallas had this game in hand. Like Adrian Peterson, 13 for 78. He wasn't able to do a whole lot running the ball. Case Keenum, 18 of 37 for 200 yard, like 206 yards, a touchdown and a pick. And they said when he threw his pick to Jalen on that first Redskins possession that it was his first pick in like 86 pass attempts or something, although he's only played in like eight games this year. So it, it was, you know, it, it was what it was. But in that game, Philadelphia and New York, the Giants actually, thanks to a 68-yard touchdown run by Saquon Barkley, a couple minutes before the end of the third quarter, actually nodded the game at 17 all going into the fourth quarter. But then Daniel Jones, as has been a problem for him throughout this season, fumbles the ball, not doesn't hang on to it. Fletcher Cox recovers it deep in Giants territory. Philadelphia pulls away after that because they get a touchdown. They get a field goal, they get a touchdown, and they start just pulling away. They end up winning, I think, like 34-17 over the Giants, thereby winning the NFC East. So Dallas, there's a lot to there's a lot to look at here, right? I wrote this past week about how it would it was only fitting that it would be an eight and eight door that hit Jason Garrett on the ass on the way out. And that's basically what's happened. Eight and eight, second in the NFC East. It's like a, it's a perfect storybook closing in terms of harmony, right? It rhymes. The first Three seasons, eight and eight disappointments. And this one, while it's only one season, was a massively anticipated season, high expectations, and it closes the book, uh, pretty much ending up where it started. So it is what it is, man. Jason Garrett, in terms of in-game adjustments, and I've ra ranted and raved about this for years, in-game adjustments is not his thing. Game management is not his thing. Do I think that he's decent message to the guys in terms of building a general culture around a team and you know everything in that regard everything off the field do I think he's pretty good I think he's fine I don't I don't think he's a I never said he was a bottom five coach what I said was that he's a middle of the pack coach who can't make in-game adjustments and can't manage a game when when the initial game plan fails he can't adjust and adapt to find what works he is who he is. After 10 years, he is who he is. So his contract's up. Dallas does not have to fire him. They just have to determine we're not going to give you a new contract. And I think he knows it. He, he wouldn't outright acknowledge it in his post-game press conference, but you could tell he was a little bit um, emotional about it. He understood, you know, in his mind, he did everything to the best of his ability. He was here 10 years, which in the NFL is unheard of, particularly when you haven't won a damn thing. And he understands, like, you know, if this is it, I feel like I did my best. Now, we can say your best wasn't good enough, but in his mind, he did his best, so he's going to hold his head high. And he kept talking about that. He related to this middle school football coach he had talking about stand tall and what was it? It was like, get back and stand tall, basically, which is more or less the stand tall part, like, 
carry yourself, as Jason Garrett would say, the right way, whether things are going good or bad. You you know, represent yourself, hold your head high, just do everything to the best of your ability to represent yourself as best as you can. Sounds incredibly Jason Garrett like, but you know, in his mind he thinks he did that. After the game, a couple hours after the game, he and his family and friends went out on the field and played catch a little bit. You don't do that unless you're fully aware this is this was my dream job. This is the last time I'm gonna be able to do this. And so he tried to kind of drink in the moment a little bit. And I don't blame him for that, you know. It is what it is. It it wasn't it wasn't an ideal hire when we made it. And even though there were improvements around the team, it just wasn't anywhere near enough. When this team played up to its potential, it could go toe-to-toe with anybody. It showed that the last two years. And when it didn't, as it didn't pretty much throughout this whole season for the most part, it struggled to beat hardly anybody. So that's that's just the state of this team, man. They have to figure some things out. They're going to have a new head coach. And with that, you're going to have to figure out your new coaching staff. You're going to have to figure this out very quickly because as I'm recording this now on a Monday morning, it is Black Monday. It is the day in which majority of the NFL teams who are going to fire their coaches, fire them. You've already had Pat Shermer of the Giants go down. By the way, look for Jason Garrett to go to New York. I think that's going to happen. He has history with them as well. And I think he is... He'll, he'll get them respectable, but I don't fear him in terms of turning them into anything. You know, Jerry had alluded earlier in the year to, well, if what, I don't want to groom Jason Garrett into this great coach, move on, and then he goes elsewhere and another franchise reaps the benefits of that. Ten years in, we know what Garrett can and can't do in terms of game management and, and uh, adjustments in game. He'll get them respectable, but he's, he's not going to turn them into anything great. I, I honestly don't think that. Would it be interesting to see that experiment play out? Sure. But if I'm if I'm Dallas, do I go, oh, I have to hang on to Garrett because the Giants might want him? No. Who cares? Move on. Is it working for you? Are you reaching your full potential with this man as your coach? No. So move on. If someone else picks him up and they can get more out of him somehow than you did, fine. It wasn't working for you, though, and that's what matters. It's not just keep away. It's what helps you be the best you can be. So, yeah, if Garrett goes there, whatever. Other fires you had, firings you had going on, uh, I think the Jaguars might fire their coach, uh, Maroney there. Uh, what was the other one you had? You had... I'm blanking on the other one, but there, there's a couple coaches who have already been fired, a couple more who are likely to go. Cowboys head coach candidates. You've heard a bunch of names out there for a while. Urban Meyer, Lincoln Riley. Now you're hearing like Ron Rivera because he's out there. You're hearing um, Mike Zimmer uh, from the Vikings. He was here previously as a defensive coordinator under Parcells, I believe. You're hearing all that stuff. I just don't, I don't see it. I don't see any of those guys. I don't think we need a defensive-minded coach. I think we need an offensive-minded coach. And Garrett was touted when he came in as like this great offensive mind. And, you know, that first season we had him, that was our most stacked offensive team we've had. I, I would say toe-to-toe this team should have been able to go toe-to-toe with them, as I redundantly say toe-to-toe. I felt like this team should have been able to go, you know, pound for pound, as I try to pivot to a different phrase now, uh, with that 2007 team offensively. But the point is Garrett, in his rookie season as offensive coordinator for this team, was so loaded with talent it masked any imperfections he might have had, except for that playoff game then against the Giants, where you saw him get super conservative and kind of piss away the game with his poor play calling management. And Dallas loses in that divisional round, despite the first round by and the number one seed in the NFC East. And it just kind of, or number one seed in the NFC, it kind of just exemplifies Garrett's entire tenure. And that happened in 2007. And it played out over the course of, of not just, what, two and a half more years of offensive coordinator, but then 10 years as a head coach. We've swam in mediocrity for so long, we've forgotten what it's like to actually succeed at anything. And I understand the back end of the 90s were rough. The early 2000s were rough. But if you want to look at, in terms of playoff experiences, like we talk about those three years that the Cowboys were 5-11, and 11, and you know just how bad those days were, how dark those days were. 
that team still had that era still had as many playoff appearances i think like it's stupid how this team underperformed in this situation i'm trying to find the exact stat here i saw someone uh post it earlier uh let's see no i'm not finding it quick quick enough so no worries but it, it basically just boils down to dallas has they've underperformed you know they've they've underperformed at every turn we have to have this change and you got some big questions you know now there's talk now that the cowboys might just end up franchise tagging dak prescott because they're afraid to give him stupid big money and you know i understand his play teetered off towards the last few weeks of the year as he dealt with a shoulder injury a, a throwing arm shoulder injury like i don't understand how you can hold that against him necessarily but you know, what do you think you're going to find? We know what we've been through in terms of the quarterback carousel of trying to find something. We went through that in the early 2000s after Troy Aikman, and it wasn't until Tony Romo was a miracle, as Jerry, drunk Jerry Jones would say, that we found something. And then we were fortunate enough to immediately find Dak after that, even before we knew that, oh, wow, Romo's, Romo's done. Like, that's how it all played out. And so the mentality to just say, well, you know, I don't. Uh, I don't think that we need to have uh, a, a Dak Prescott, and we can just go draft a quarterback, dude. You're picking seventeenth. By the way, winning this game against the Redskins when it ends up not mattering, I understand that at the same time, but it it costs you probably the twelfth pick and gives you the seventeenth. That's going to hurt because now to get a primo prospect, you may either have to trade up. Or you have to hope that you can hit somewhere in that range. You know, Van Der Esch, I think, was 19th. You need to be able to hit in that range now. And we'll see how that pans out. Van Der Esch having a, they say, minor neck surgery in the offseason. I'm not so sure. He had a major red flag with a neck injury uh, in the draft. And that's why Big Game James, Law Nation, and myself were all beside ourselves when Dallas took the pick. And for one year, we looked like we were the idiots for having that reaction because he was a pro bowler and he was phenomenal. He was bad this year. Even before his injury, he was bad. And then you kept hearing like, oh, day to day, day to day, uh, week, 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 week to week. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Oh, well, now, now there are whispers that this might be career shortening for him. This might be a situation where he might potentially even have to retire depending on how this surgery goes. So there's major question marks there. And that's just another first round pick who for one year, you got gold out of them, but that's not the kind of value you need in the first round. And so suddenly this team that's been hitting, 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 hitting in the first round has been missing, missing, missing. Taco was a miss. You didn't have one last year, but you took Tristan Hill in the second round. That looks like a painful miss. Uh, Van Der Esch was a hit for one year, but now that's a miss. Like Jalen Smith, uh, 2016 second round pick. He was great last year. I thought he should have been a pro bowler. He had a great game today or yesterday against the Redskins, but he, he had a down year. He had a pretty poor year. So, like, you see all these different elements, and you're like, oof, there's a lot to figure out here. Zeke wasn't even on his his extension yet. Like, he was still finishing off that rookie deal. So, his six-year deal now, that's going to kick in, what, next year? I mean, it's <laughs> it's pretty pretty hard to swallow here that we're going to be looking at this and thinking, wow, we paid $90 million to a guy who's never going to play better than he already has. I don't like that. I don't like it at all. And Dak, you know, Troy Aikman said during the game yesterday, this was kind of telling, I thought, the way he phrased it and framed it, he didn't say, I think. He talked about not just Dak and his quest for a new deal here. He said, basically, after week one against the Giants, we gave the Cowboys our offer that we wanted, and that was after they had already told us before the game what they wanted to pay us. We countered, and there was no communication the rest of the season. Dak should have been done last off season, Like, last year. He should have been done before camp. Or in camp, at least. He should have been done before Amari Cooper. Still not done. Question marks there. And he should have been done before Zeke. Especially before Zeke. Because Zeke had two years left on his deal. And then you give Zeke the richest contract in NFL history for a running back. And yeah, I don't get it. I don't get it. I don't I don't see that same value or production out of him. I would have... I understand. He's, he's trying to get his money. I'm not going to fault a guy for going after his money. But I'm saying as an organization... I don't agree with it. I don't agree with that assessment. And I've long since remained firm in my stance on that. But basically, Dak looked at that and he's frustrated. It lingered on his mind all year that 
Doesn't matter what I'm doing out here. Even when he was slinging it in the first half of the year, even when going into the New England game, there was talk of him being like a top three MVP candidate. Now, that was around that time that his performance started to drop off. But up until that point, he was in the thick of that discussion. You know, a distant third, whatever. But he was there. He was in that discussion. And there was still nothing from the Cowboys. It was radio silence. And that kind of loomed on his mind a little bit where he's like, dude, what, what I was a compensatory fourth round pick. What more could you ask of me than what I've already delivered? And what Troy said in that case, he didn't just bring that up. He also brought up, and this is where his wording was very important. He didn't say, I think he said talking with Dak and his team, basically his agents Four years ago, when the Cowboys were 13-3, and three, had locked up the number one seed in the NFC, you still had, going into the playoffs that year, Jerry Jones coming out and saying, wouldn't it be a perfect storybook ending if somehow Tony Romo came in off the bench and led us to a Super Bowl win? That's a slap in the face to Dak. And we talked about it a little bit there. Like, how do you think that he handles that? Well, publicly, he said nothing. And so people are like, oh, it didn't bother him. The hell it didn't. Just because he didn't express it, just because he didn't make a public show of it, doesn't mean that he forgot that disrespect. Troy said, not I think Dak has felt underappreciated because of that. He said flat out, Dak has felt not as appreciated as he should be. And that has stuck in his mind. You you talk about guys putting a chip on their shoulder when they sense disrespect or anything like that. I mean, we talk about that kind of thing all the time. Dak's getting it from his own franchise, from his own organization. He's like, yo, I just did the unthinkable for you in my rookie year when nobody thought I should be here. I was a top three MVP finalist in that year. And you're still talking about taking my job from me and giving it to Tony Romo. Now, Romo, for his case in this, he was lobbying to get his job back the final month of the season. He was trying to get them to sit Dak down and let him take back over. And that's the competitor in him. I don't want to kill Tony for that. But when it became clear from talking with the team and the coaching staff that it wasn't going to happen, that the team had rallied behind Dak, that's when Tony was like, okay, uh, I'm going to go out here and I'm going to do this whole meritocracy speech and I'm going to basically pass the torch. And you know, I remember getting a little bit... Uh, Slightly choked up listening to that, but it's it's something interesting where, in hindsight, as you look at it, it doesn't feel as genuine to me. Like, yes, I don't. I'm not saying he was faking the speech, but it it was undeniable at that point that it was done. It's not like Romo came out and like, all right, I'm gonna put all this to rest for Dak's sake, for the team's sake. It was like, no, the team is saying it's not you anymore, and Tony basically saying well, I'm not going to be your backup. So it was like, in his mind, he was like, okay, this is my basically more or less retirement speech from the Cowboys because he never got a a retirement presser or anything like that. He just kind of sat back and was like, okay, meritocracy, here you go. And then he was gone that year. Like, he did not play again. Uh, He played, what, one series, two series in the Week 17 finale at Philadelphia that year and threw his last touchdown pass to Terrence Williams. But that was it. That was it. So I don't know, man. I look at it and I just think like, I I, I feel like this team is kind of underappreciated Dak. 13 and three as a rookie, top three MVP finalist in that regard. The next year, nine and seven, still not a losing record. It was a disappointing year. And yes, he had some definite sophomore slump and struggles. The next year, Yes, a bad start, but they got the right guys in in terms of Amari Cooper in that regard. And then Dak leads them to his first playoff win there. And he's done everything he can. And he's he's raised his game at least somewhat every year. And this year, I think he took a pretty big step forward where if it weren't for the last month kind of souring the memory a little bit, I think a lot of us would be looking at this and saying, dude, Dak Prescott took a major step forward this year. In terms of total offense, this is the number one offense in the league. Dak Prescott nearly... He, he fell one yard shy of the franchise record for most passing yards in a season, that being to Tony Romo, which, hey, interestingly enough, I believe was the 2011 season when Dallas went, you guessed it, under Jason Garrett, 8-8. Eight and eight. So 
one yard shy of Tony Romo's single season franchise record. That's where Dak wound up this year. Like Dak slung the ball. He had what, 11 picks on the year? Like his interception numbers are still down. Tony Romo, yeah, Tony Romo had one year where he was like nine, but Romo's best years were like a nine, a 10, and an 11 interception year. A lot of other years he had 20, 26. Like, he threw a lot of picks. I don't know if it was ever as high as 26. He, I don't think he was quite pushing Jameis numbers. But you get my point. Like, a lot of interceptions. Dak, Dak's had his worst year be 13, I want to say. He was like 4, 13. I don't remember how many he had last year, but then he had 11 this year. And he passed for well over 4,000 yards this year. So best passing numbers of his career are almost best in franchise history. Number one rated offense in the league. Dak took a big step forward. And I think it's still important to acknowledge that. So I don't know what Dallas is going to do, but if you franchise Dak after all of this, and I understand not wanting to hamstring a new head coach and say, hey, yo, we've already given $100 million to this guy. You're stuck with him. I understand not necessarily wanting to do that, but I, I think it would be bad to do it to Dak because you've already shown plenty of disrespect. And I'm not even just talking about the fan base, a lot of the fan base. We've thrown him so much disrespect and not appreciated what he's done to date that I think franchising him would kind of be like another slap in the face. And I don't know, man, if it affected him on some level this year, how do you think it's going to affect him when you then franchise him and deny him his big money when he's outplayed in terms of his four combined years, outplayed Jared Goff and outperformed Carson Wentz. Because, yeah, Jared Goff went to a Super Bowl, but it had nothing to do with him. It was everything to do with the run game and with the defense and with the coaching staff. Uh, he, he was barely a bus driver in that case. What, did, what about Carson Wentz? Oh, well, he played at one year nearly an MVP level. Yeah, nearly one year. It's the outlier. Dax had two years where he's been, you know, rookie year in the top three of the MVP discussion. And this year, I think he'll probably end up outside the top five now because of the last month, obviously. But he was in that conversation for a while. And Carson Wentz had nothing to do with the playoff run. He had nothing to do with the next year's playoff run either. That was all literally Nick Foles. So, or Foles. Uh, you got nothing. Nothing. So, rather than disrespecting Dak, I think they have to pay him. Amari Cooper? Uh, man, it's a weird discussion because I know Cooper's issues on the road are pronounced in his career thus far. He doesn't have that alpha mentality, but he's a drama-free player. He's still a fantastic route runner who is a perfect match with Dak. I don't think he was close to healthy this year, although he and the Cowboys won't say that he was hurt. I, I have a hard time believing that because the, the stuff they were telling us he was dealing with, plantar fascist, uh, fasciitis, even the stuff he was dealing with in that regard in camp, that heals naturally, sure, but you need like six to nine weeks off it. He never missed a game. And as a result, it's like, when did you take the time to heal that injury, let alone the knee, let alone the hamstring or the Achilles or the foot, whatever. Like you were constantly dealing with something. So I don't know. I'll be curious to see how much of that was impacted by the the nicks and bumps and the little injuries that didn't require like season ending anything and how that plays out. Me, I look at it this way. He is a perfect complement to Dak. He's a very good precision route runner with big play potential. We'll see what that number ends up coming out to for him, but I think you keep him if you're Dallas. I do. Now, what I would probably say is you can do, you can basically, uh, what's the phrase there? It's it's a form of tag, uh, tagging him, not franchise tag, although he is a candidate for that. But basically, it's like a temporary tag. You basically let him go test the market, and then it, it gives you, A, the final say on if you match it. You have that option to match it. And B... It gives you the ability to. Um, it gives you the ability then uh, to bring them back on that deal. So even if you were to franchise a guy, whether it's Dak or Cooper, if if you were to then trade them, that's two first round picks. No one's going to give that up for either guy. I don't think. Even though Dak would get you a lot of value. So something that you have to consider there. I think Dallas in that regard should do the temp tag in this case allow him to test the market, see what he's going to get, but have the final say. And that's my thinking on it. Because then you get him, he still gets basically the deal he would have got to leave, 
He says he wants to be here. You do that. You keep your number one receiver who is so critical to your quarterback's success and growth. And I'm just not a fan of using, like, we got a lot of needs. I'm not a fan of using a first-round pick on a wide receiver necessarily. I know there's going to be great names out there. I don't think that Judy from Alabama is going to fall to you that far. I don't think that C.D. Lamb from Oklahoma is going to fall that far. And I don't see Dallas trading up from 17 into the top 10 to get one of them or just outside the top 10. Uh, That's, again, where winning against the Redskins hurts you. Because now, instead of picking 12 and only having to move up a couple stop, a couple spots maybe, now you got to move up by leaps and bounds. And I just think that that hamstrings you. You have less draft capital you can afford to spend to get what you want in that regard. So I don't see Dallas taking a, a wide receiver in the first round and letting Cooper walk. I just don't. But we'll see. It's going to be interesting to see what Dallas does moving forward. They've got a lot of decisions they got to make. they got a lot of big names, a lot of important guys on their team that are going to be free agents. Randall Cobb's a free agent. Robert Quinn is a free agent. Michael Bennett's a free agent. Um, you got a whole lot of guys like that that you got to figure out, right? And we're going to have to see what Dallas is going to do, who they're going to resign. you got so many key guys, and I get it. The team underperforms, so you're like, well, how many of those key guys do you want to bring back? True, fair, but there's a lot you're going to have to address. You're also going to have to see about the health of some players, be it Dak, be it Cooper, be it uh, Demarcus Lawrence, who struggled with some kind of back injury again the other day, and he just got paid too. So there's a lot going on here, but it's going to be a very intriguing Cowboys offseason because at the very least, we should get a fresh perspective and voice in here other than Jason Garrett, and that's going to change the direction a little bit of the franchise, and we'll see. Okay, new coaching staff, new... new uh, What's the phrase I'm looking for here? Basically, new hierarchy in place. Okay. What what is the philosophy? Who are you going after in the draft? Who are you targeting? What do you value? What is your philosophy? But we'll see, man. That's going to do it for my time, though. I'm DDP. Don't forget to like this video. Leave a comment below. Subscribe to the Dallas Prospect. And until next time, remember, every legend was once a prospect. Peace.